programs, and I learned all kinds of things uh, from this book, and this book is available uh, for you tonight if, if you're interested. Uh, just last year, Barbara Hunter Schultz wrote uh, Flying Carpets, Flying Wings. And uh, what was noted out, I don't know if anybody mentioned to you, Barbara, is that the Halliburton Hangover House had some perhaps illegal demolition, interior demolition this, this past week or so. And behind us on the wall, uh, the city council has a uh, emergency meeting uh, tomorrow morning uh, about that. So uh, in 2011, uh, Barbara Schultz wrote uh, the bio or, or Flying Carpets, Flying Wings, the biography of Moy W. Stevens. So uh, his life changed when he got a phone call from Richard Halliburton uh, asking this pilot to fly him around the, around, the wall, around the world. And in 1932, they did that. And then uh, that was the, the, the best-selling, most important book by Richard Halliburton in 1932. Uh, so... Uh, I, I, I think we're in for a treat to learn about uh, these important people to the heritage and the culture uh, and, and the history of uh, Laguna Beach. So with that, let me turn it over to Barbara Hunter Schultz. Thank you. Uh, first, most people like to know why I, I wrote these books. Um, the Poncho Barnes book was written because um, in 19... 89, there was a movie called The Poncho Barn Story on TV with Valerie Bertinelli. And because our family is very uh, ensconced with the Barnes family, um, I decided that, that that wasn't the right story about Poncho and I was going to take about six months to put something together. Well, it took me seven years and raised my two sons. But uh, her son, Bill Barnes, had given me my uh, check ride when I got my pilot's license. And uh, my husband had flown as a flight instructor for Barnes Aviation, as did both my sons. Um, my wedding gift was Pro Professor Thaddeus, Lo Thaddeus Lowe's library table, which was very awesome under condition that I restore it, which I did. And when I did uh, the research on Poncho Barnes, I was able to interview first-person individuals such as her social secretary that lived with her from 29 to 33, who was able to describe to me what the house was like. And she was a journalist and had done a, a, a short piece on Poncho as well, which included all of Poncho's miscellaneous lovers and things like that. Uh, <laughs> So I didn't know about Moy Stevens. I just knew that Moy was a good friend. And um, I took my boys out of school. We traveled down to Ensenada a few times and, and stayed with the, um, Moy and his wife, Ines, and was able to interview him. And I always thought that he needed to have a biography done as well. He'd written one, but it stopped before he did the flying carpet trip. Um, and the reason for my wanting to do his biography, I had interviewed a lot of um, gentlemen and women who um, created records, set records back in the 20s and 30s. People that knew Howard Hughes that worked for him, people that were the first to fly across the Pacific, and on and on. They always wanted to tell me what great things they'd done. Moore wasn't interested in doing that. He was more interested in talking about what his friends had done and the importance of safety in aviation. Um, so he just was the kindest person. And I didn't get to meet Poncho. She died the year before I got my pilot's license. But I have anecdotes from my husband, as well as living in the Antelope Valley. I was able to meet a lot of people that did know her. And um, I won't tell you how far I used to travel to go interview people. but. Um, Foremost, I am, I'm a researcher, so that's what I do, is find people that knew these individuals. When I did Moy's book, it was much more difficult because, you know, 15 years later, most of these people have passed on, so the hunt was on for the children of these people. And it took me three years to find the three daughters of Moy's best friend, Dick Rinaldi. And um, even that was difficult because... They were very reticent to share some of these photographs with me, but I explained that Moy's biography would not be complete without 
that segment of his life and they were more than happy and, and they were very pleased with the product. And, and the most meaning is, or meaningful result is when Moy's son, whose also name is Moy, called me up in tears and said, you gave me your, my father back. And so I accomplished what I wanted to do was to let people know who Moy Stevens was and this is why I go around doing my presenting um, and I just enjoy doing it. So tonight I'm going to show where Moy and Pancho actually started together. They didn't know each other at the time. Um, go through Pancho's life and then um, go through Moya's life. And uh, I think you'll see how they're interconnected as far as the aviation circles go. Um, these are just some new pictures that I received. Even after books are done, people still send me things, which is such a delight. And this is a typical Pancho picture. Uh, they first met at the 1911 um, Dominguez Air Meet, which was held at Dominguez Airfield. It was the first heavier than aircraft uh, meet on the West Coast. Pancho Barnes was there with her grandfather, Thaddeus Lowe, the Civil War balloonist. Roscoe Turner, who did more for aviation than anybody else, even took on the title of Colonel Turner, which he wasn't. And uh, I believe uh, William Boeing was there, Jimmy Doolittle was there, and of course Maury Stevens was there. And they were very young, but it, it left an impression upon them. So Pancho was born in 1901, Florence Leontine Lowe, and she died in 1975 in Boron, California. She grew up in the Low Estate in Pasadena. They had uh, room, separate rooms for all the dining um, meals during the day. They had a set of Chinese chimes. There were seven of them that got went from small to very large. And I actually have those in my house hanging up. So she grew up the life, when you talk about silver spoons, I think hers was gold plated. And as I said before, her grandfather who's seated was Thaddeus uh, Lowe, who created Mount Lowe Railway just uh, north of uh, Pasadena in the Sierra Madre Mountains. He was also credited with turning the tide of the Civil War by taking his balloon up over um, Confederate territory and telegraphing back the positions to the Union Army. And Pancho always considered him the granddaddy of the Air Force, and technically speaking, he could well be. Pancho's father is to the, um, oops, excuse me, we'll get this right. Um, this is Pancho's father, Thad Lowe, Jr. I just had this original Mount Lowe trail trip that went up the side um, of the mountains up to the top. There were two hotels, and there was also um, Professor Lowe's observatory. Pasadena's changed a little bit since <laughs> the turn of the century. There was also the uh, Echo Mountain House, and there was the Alpine Tavern as well. And similar to Hearst Castle, he had a zoo, and uh, Professor Lowe had his zoo as well to the left where the gentlemen are looking. Most of this uh, was all burned and uh, destroyed by windstorms and fire by uh, early 1930s. The rail bed is still there, a lot of people hike up. But, uh, the passengers took the tram from Pasadena up to the Pacific Electric Trail, our train platform. And Pancho is right here with her head bowed and this is her son Bill Barnes. Uh, this is Pancho and her cousins. Uh, Pancho is uh, right here, and this is her uh, cousin Dean Banks, who she would become flying partners with. Very few pictures all through her life with uh, dresses on. Her, her parents sent her to public school, and they said uh, that her outrageous behavior with bringing manure in on her boots from the stables and swearing and spitting and shooting rifles uh, was because of those children. So she was sent to uh, the Ramona convent in Alhambra, and <laughs> perhaps the nuns could have helped her out, but she became their first runaway. <laughs> and after that, she was sent to the um, Westridge School for Girls, and she is Friar Tuck in the play Robin Hood. I think the only thing she profited from at Westridge School was the headmistress uh, motto, which was the sky's the limit for an educated woman. I think she took that to a whole different meaning. 
Um, where the nuns in Westridge uh, School couldn't change their daughter, they thought because the bishops might be a bit closer to God, they sent her to the Bishop's School for Girls in La Jolla, where she did graduate in 1919. And then she had an arranged marriage, which was not atypical during that time, um, to Rankin C. Barnes. And he, he profited a little bit extra money than his stipend just being the reverend, and he attributed Poncho's wild ways to her being from a wealthy family. It had nothing to do with her playing craps or blackjack in the rectory or giving jackknives to the little boys to learn catechism. But uh, 1921, she, they had their first child. They were married in 1920, and she said it was by immaculate conception. But, um, and he was named after Pancho's brother, who died in 1913 from um, uh, leukemia. And Pancho was quite the character. She loved her dog and she's got little Billy on there and romping around. And this is uh, Billy with his father. Bill was pretty much raised by a, a nanny because Pancho was gallivorting around wherever she was doing those things and uh, uh, the father was a member of the Episcopalian Church and was off um, Mexico, different countries, seeing where the money could go to help out um, some impoverished peoples. Well, 1924, Pancho's mother passed away unexpectedly, and Pancho inherited what would be about four and a half million dollars today, which was pretty much gone by 1929. Uh, she had furs, jewels. Her social secretary told me she had just the most elegant clothes designed for her, and she just dropped things wherever she wanted. She never hung anything up, uh, never put her jewelry away. And she did have a, a more of a man's stature. She had very slim hips, very broad shoulders. And uh, one of the gentlemen that you'll see later said that she could pick up a 100-pound bag of feet on each shoulder and carry it. And she pretty much left the rectory after three years of attempting to be the good rector's wife. It just... Uh, it didn't work out for her. I asked a historian with Episcopalian Church, well, what did they think of Reverend Barnes and this wild wife? And they said, well, they could forgive him because he was so well respected and they just kind of ignored her. Um, mid 1920s, she took a uh, cruise around South America with some very wealthy um, fellows or families she knew from. Texas uh, on the Lusitania, which is a sister ship to the Titanic. And when she came back, uh, she took her parents' original two-story home and changed it into a lavish Spanish mansion. In fact, she went to great lengths to look as though she had a Latin heritage, even though she didn't. Um, she had film scenarios create different uh, motives in the different rooms. Her bedroom had no doors on it. It had heavy blue velvet drapes. Her uh, round bed was on a platform. She had uh, stars painted on the ceilings that sparkled. And it just went on and on. And she did all the wood carving, as her father had done wood carving, uh, for all the cornices and the uh, moldings in the house, as well as the mantel. And this is the back entry, and to the left is the, um, the pond. She was really bored after she redid her house, and her cousin Dean Banks was flying, and she talked to him about flying, and he said, well, go on out to Ross Balloon Field, which is now Santa Anita Racetrack, and uh, find my instructor, Ben Catlin, who became her instructor. And once she received her student pilot's license and she had a transport license. Um, she was in the midst of a crowd that we think is maybe untouchable or more famous than the rest, but it included Lindbergh, it included um, Earhart. They'd go to Leo Correa's uh, place down in Malibu and ride scooters up and down Pacific Coast Highway. So she was a very accepted uh, person because she was an excellent pilot. She also could entertain. That's where all of her money went. I mean, she, 
her parties were uh, unfathomable. Um, shortly after she received her permit to fly by herself, she bought herself a travel air. It's actually a 9,000 because it has a Seaman Halsky engine, and at the top it says, I'm up in the air over my travel air, Pancho Barnes. And you can see how muscular she is. She was really quite um, an avid and very successful horseback rider, which I think helped to make her a really good pilot as well. And Reverend Barnes did go flying. I just like this picture. But he knew that the future of transportation, uh, transportation lay with aviation. He just wasn't sure about her, his wife's participation in it because she used to love to go up to about 1,200 feet on Sunday when he was just delivering the sermon and dive bomb the steeple and circle it a few times. I think he was a very tolerant man. So this is uh, Reverend Barnes and um, Poncho's cousin, Dean Banks. Poncho became a um, travel air company representative. She would um, pick up airplanes in Wichita and fly them out to the West Coast. She had chance to meet Walter Beach's wife before they were married, Ollie Van, and Ollie Van said very quietly to somebody when Poncho walked in the office, is that a man or a woman? And Poncho, of course, heard that, and she just loved to rip over her shirt and say, well, what do you think? <laughs> and to this day, there's not one picture of Poncho at the beach factory in Wichita. <laughs> not one. None in her, in any of the history books either. Oops, excuse me. She was a Union Oil representative. She had the Union Oil logo plan, uh, on her airplane and she would travel around. They would pay for her fuel and uh, she would represent the company. And more than anything, she wanted to set a record as all pilots were doing at that time. Of course, those records were broken the next week. She went to Alan Lockheed, whose real name was Lockhead, uh, but he and his brother changed that name to Lockheed. And they had designed the Vega, which is behind them. Uh, most of the ladies used that airplane because it was, um, had a lot of endurance and a lot of um, uh, speed. But she wanted to attempt an altitude record, but this was 1930, and Lockheed didn't really have enough money to sponsor her, and Poncho was pretty much broke at this point. So it, uh, the record never did go off. Anybody recognize the gentleman on the front seat? I throw this in just to show you who she hung out with. <laughs> it's, it's General Billy Mitchell. But she, went, she belonged to the Flintwich Writing School in Pasadena, which um, Patton belonged to. She was good friends with uh, Roosevelt. In fact, he, he stayed at her home and, uh, when he was doing his campaigning. Uh, this is kind of an overlap picture, but we have Jimmy Angel, who discovered Angel Falls in South America, Halliburton, uh, Poncho, and Moy. They really were very good friends. She met Ramon Navarro when she was doing some uh, doubling for Louise Fazenda in the early Rin Tin Tin movies. Uh, she did click lighting. She did anything she could to be a part of that movie crowd. She really enjoyed it. And um, I know that Ramon had different persuasions than women, but I asked his social secretary, well, Pancho says she had a relationship with Ramon, and she says, oh, she did. She was just very curious, and anyway. <laughs> and this is a great shot of, of Pancho and Ramon. The gentleman, Nels Griffith, uh, he grew up here in Laguna. His uh, father was a very well-known, I can't think of his first name, um, plein air, um, is that right, plein air, um, painter? Yeah, that sounds right. So Pancho bought Ramon Navarro an airplane, and he did a little flying, but he didn't get very serious about it. And he said, well, you know, you got me an airplane, so I think it was about 2 in the morning they went over to Ramon's favorite photographer, which was George Harrell. Pancho had started him in uh, the business in the early 20s in Laguna Beach. 
And uh, he did some lovely shots. You can see why he's such a good photographer. He's able to hide her double chin. And, <laughs> and I did meet one of her cousins. And I said, oh my goodness, you look just like Pancho. And she says, don't you say that. <laughs> I spent a lot of money fixing that neck. <laughs> so these are some really nice shots of Pancho. Sadly to say, she didn't become a starlet. I like this as my favorite picture. And then I have the original, this is the George Harrell, but some Poncho must have commissioned someone to do a painting of it. Uh, so I have a, a painting of this. She met Duncan Rinaldo while she was doing involved with the movies, and she fell in love. In fact, I think Duncan is the only man that she ever truly loved. She helped him when he was um, being incarcerated and potentially being um, de uh, deported because he was in the United States illegally. But she paid for all of his expenses. And uh, the next slide should show uh, she traveled back east for other reasons. But when she was there, she spoke with Roosevelt. And uh, he was able to get Duncan released a little bit early and not become deported. When Pancho brought him back to San Marino, she was expecting they'd continue the relationship they had, but Duncan just looked at her and said, I could never love a woman like you. So that was, that was pretty devastating to Pancho. Uh, 1929 was the first national air race for women. It was dubbed the Powder Puff Derby by uh, Will Rogers because Women weren't supposed to be able to enter the man's world and do flying of airplanes at that time. So they nicknamed them Skylarks and Powder Puffs and Ladies of the Heavens. But uh, these women were very serious about the race. It started at Cloverfield, which is now Santa Monica, and went to uh, Cleveland for the National Air Race. Mary May Hayslip is to the left, Cliff Henderson, manager for all the National Air Races, and then, of course, Poncho. Uh, they took off um, in September 1929 and headed toward Cleveland. Pancho did really well coming in first and second at the different stops. When she uh, came in to um, Pecos, she didn't see a car that had driven out onto the runway after she touched down, and she flew an airplane that has a big radial engine, and you're virtually blind. So she saw him in time to turn, but clipped one set of wings and cartwheeled and took out the other set. So she was out of the race, but she went on in one of the Traveler Company airplanes because her, her friends, her fans, were already in Cleveland to congratulate her on her win. Uh, she loved to fly with Chiquita, her little parachute with his, uh, so cute. When she was back at uh, Cleveland, Walter Beach introduced two airplanes that were kept under wraps till the day of the race, which gave them the name Mystery Ships. It was the first airplane to beat the military entries at the National Air Races. And there were two of the ships. Um, this is a sister ship of the one that Poncho bought. Uh, when she heard that the, the sister ship was up for sale, she telegraphed Walter Beach and said, I'm on my way uh, to purchase the airplane. So she flew back there. And um, I met a gentleman that was actually there at the time. He was a son of uh, one of the workers, but he was a young boy, probably 12 or 13. And um, she tried to horse trade with Walter Beach to get the price down. And he said, no, you know, it is what it is. The other story, which is more fitting for uh, Poncho's personality, was that uh, she had uh, tried to horse trade with Walter Beach, and when he wouldn't, be flexible, she gave him some money and she said, I'll be back in a week. She went to the downtown Eaton Hotel and turned tricks and brought the rest of the money back in a bag. <laughs> That's not the true story, though. But it's a good one. It's much better. First thing she did when she got back, she went to Howard Hughes, who was redoing Hell's Angels. Uh, he'd already done it as a talkie, but, uh, or as a silent film, but talkies came out, so he went and spent another million or so dollars to um, put sound into the movie, which is where um, Jean Harlow got her start, because the original actress had a thick German accent, and it would have been very inappropriate. Um, so Pancho 
flew her travel air mystery ship around a balloon with a mic in it suspended a thousand feet over Cotto Field, which was Howard Hughes's field in the San Fernando Valley, to create all the airplane noise for that movie. And then Earhart in July, uh, or excuse me, I think June of 1931, set a, a women's speed record. Well, Pancha wasn't going to be outdone. She, she was going to set a speed record too. And on her second attempt at Mines Field, which is now LAX, uh, she flew 196 plus miles per hour and uh, was crowned the new speed queen. And this is a great shot of her in her airplane. It has a Union gas emblem on it. Note it only has one seat, and it was a very fast airplane, so she, I think, was very um, gifted as far as being a pilot. And here she's being graduated by the official National Aeronautic Association timer, Joe Nykrant. And then about a year later, Governor Roth of California presented Pancho a trophy as the fastest woman in the world, and there was an additional trophy because she'd set several speed records between San Francisco and Los Angeles in the meantime. Uh, Pancho was good friends with all the ladies. I did ask one that uh, was very proper society lady. I said, what did you gals really think about Pancho? And they said, well, we know she had a bad reputation, but she was a lot of fun. So they were very forgiving. But after Earhart flew the Atlantic herself, uh, Pancho Barnes put, a, um, uh, put on a banquet for her. And this gal right here, Elizabeth Ulysses Grant McQueen, um, I'm actually doing a project on her. She formed the first, uh, the Women's International Aeronautical Association. Um, next, Pancho formed the Motion Picture Stunt Pilots Association in her house in San Marino. Uh, she was the only woman to ever belong to that. She's in the center. And um, this is Frank Clark, who doubled for Clark Gable in most of his movies. They look very much the same. And this is the, they're gathered around her lily pond in the back. And they used to have a good time. They rode their motorcycles and horses through the house, and nobody ever seemed to mind. Um, 1931 as well, uh, Lavelle Sweeley in the white dress wanted to form a women's auxiliary to the Army Air Corps and went to Pancho because Pancho got things no, done, and she knew people like General Hap Arnold and everybody um, at the top, so they were able to form the Women's Air Reserve, or WAR, which is what they were called. And this is a group of them, um, Gladys O'Donnell, Clima Granger, Chubby Miller, and General Barnes, that she took on the title of General Barnes. <laughs> so in, in the fall of 1934, Phoebe Omley, who was a member of the 99s Women Pilots Organization, wanted the 99s to support her because the um, bureaucrats wanted to limit flying for women during a certain time of the month. <laughs> so the 99s didn't go, want to go, so Pancho said, well, we'll go. So they took off in their steermans to go back east when they arrived at the meeting, Phoebe gave Pancho a paper with a list of words on it she was not to use. <laughs> and I forgot to add, she could swear like a sailor for an hour and never repeat herself. Um, so I think the bureaucrats got a big kick out of the list of words. But as it was, um, that, that ruling was not implemented. And how are they going to figure that out anyway? So. Uh, this is the group of the gals uh, that went back east. The one that I interviewed um, is this gal, and she lived up in Oregon. When they arrived in New York, they were um, at a very swank hotel to raise some money for their organization, and then they were temporarily arrested by the police because there was a law in the books that said women are not to be in public in pants. But they got that straightened out. When she came back, she could no longer um, support her lifestyle in San Marino, so she traded a, a building, apartment building in Hollywood that she owned for 80 acres in the Mojave Desert, which was known as Miroc at that time. 
Uh, the gentleman that helped move her out um, is Granny Norris here, and then this is Bill, who had been living with his father in New York. And um, Granny was the one that said she could lift a 100-pound bag on each shoulder. And she started the Rancho Oro Verde, or Green Gold, and sold alfalfa. She raised hogs, goats, uh, quail for the California um, Conservation Society to see if they'd make it. And she had up to 400 head of quarter horses at one time. So the society woman is now the rancher. And her father had taught her how to raise animals and, and crops and things, so it wasn't uh, new to her. During uh, World War II, she bought two buildings, surplus buildings from the um, military, and those became her uh, motel rooms. And this, the top part on this picture housed her library. She was very well read, a very, very intelligent woman. And she really did create an oasis in the desert. But then there wasn't a lot of competition. So she had the Army Air Corps that would come up from March Air Force Base and, or Air Corps Base. And these are just some shots of what the uh, Rancho Oro Verde looked like. And if you go through the door on the left, you would enter the bar, which was actually known as the Happy Bottom Riding Club, which uh, was the name of her stables during the war. And even though there's five different variations on the, where the Happy Bottom Riding Club name came from, which are all of a sexual nature, the, during Merry Old England, they had Happy Bottom Riding Clubs. So each club was uh, a day's ride. And not only was the horse stabled, the night was stabled. So I think that's where she got that name. But this uh, shows you her pictures with her horses, and she loved her horses. And she worked alongside the ranch hands without a shirt on as well. Uh, this is the gate to her ranch, which was shut the night that uh, Chuck Yeager came riding back before um, the next day he had his uh, flight in the Bell X-1 to break the sound barrier. And because the gate was shut, the horse bolted, and uh, it really wasn't his wife that he was with as he states in his book. So. Um, in 1939, the Civilian Pilot Training Program was instigated by the federal government. It was the largest program ever. And uh, Pancho was contracted to supply instructors and airplanes for that program. And um, she did some instructing, but really not very much. And then, of course, there were the hostesses. At first, they were women that were just out of work, starlets that want to come up and meet the flyboys. But when business got busy, after um, Al Boyd brought the test pilot school out to Edwards from Wright Pat, she put advertisements in the um, newspapers and interviewed the gals. Um, this gal here is Gladys Barnes, who married Bill Barnes. And this, uh, some more shots of the lovely ladies. And there was a sign behind the bars that we're not responsible for that oldest of professions. And I know that she did escort ladies off that took money for certain activities. But she, on the other hand, encouraged them to rent a motel room from her. But she, she perpetuated these rumors. She would drive through the little town of Lancaster, you know, 1,900 people in the entire valley at this time. and she'd introduce her ladies of the night that were in her car, and she, she just liked to perpetuate rumors. But did she run a brothel? Was she a madam? Probably not, but it makes a good story, too. Um, she had her walls filled with her accomplishments, as well as the um, prototypes that were flown uh, in the Los Angeles or Southern California area. Uh, she, her good friends came to visit her. Jimmy Doodle was probably, he and his wife, her most dearest friend all of her, her life. And the gentleman on the left is Cecil Meadows, a, a race pilot who ran Meadows Field in Bakersville, which is why it's named after him. And then Roy Rogers, of course, she had one of the uh, original Trigger's uh, descendants, and then Carl Ballinger who was a test pilot for Republic. And her, her friends didn't forget her. Baron Hilton told me that he used to go up 
to her ranch and fly his little Cessna 140, which is the kind of airplane that I have. But we've got, let me see if I can remember some of these fellows. Um, uh, John Forsyth, I think this is Arthur Kennedy. Uh, Bill Barnes, Pancho, looking like she's having more fun than she should. Uh, Joel McRae, and I, I don't know who the others are. But I was also told that Howard Hughes flew up there, but I couldn't verify that. But they'd come up and uh, hunt jackrabbits, rattlesnakes were off limits because they wouldn't hurt anybody, but the jackrabbits ate the alfalfa. And they finally figured out, Granny told me, that they should all sit in the front seat if they're shooting because somebody got shot because somebody from the back seat was trying to shoot, so. And then she had her world famous, or I should say, California famous rodeos, and uh, they were started during World War II when she had a cowboy school as well. She trained them in roping and um, what cowboys do. Uh, she had uh, some of the hostesses and the stunt people. You can see the one guy on top looks like a Wild Bill Hickok type. They'd ride around to the local um, towns to advertise the up and coming rodeo. And yes, this gal was totally naked during the intermission of the rodeo. Nobody will volunteer who it was, but I know it was. And Pancho considered herself the unofficial mother of the supersonic age. Today, when people, uh, test pilots, uh, complete a mission in a prototype, they have a, a post-flight briefing, which is very formal. Pancho's uh, place was the debriefing room after all flights, and there was a lot of drinking going on. That doesn't happen now. but. Uh, she would have them sign the picture of the plane that they flew in. She would give them a steak dinner as well. Uh, new initiates were blindfolded, their shoes removed, and they walked on this uh, mat. And if you can't figure it out, it's a <laughs> woman's falsies all hooked together. After Chuck Yeager's uh, flight breaking the sound barrier, the motion picture stunt pilots got together to celebrate that accomplishment. The gentleman in the back was so broke um, in 1939, 1940, that he had to hitchhike from Los Angeles and trade working in Pancho's Dairy for flight lessons. I don't know if anybody recognizes that, but it's Kirk Gregorian. <laughs> And then uh, Paul Mann's very famous uh, sump pilot is here. Pancha was also a musician and a composer. She wrote a song called By Your Side, which was on the flip side of Jerry Wallace's Primrose Lane. She made a bet with the owner of uh, the crab cooker, Bob Rubion, that he wrote a song called Too Poop to Pop. And they made a bet who could sell more copies, and she did, so she won the bet, but she gave him a, a tortoise as a consolation prize. And then you can see that's uh, Chuck Yeager, um, Bud Anderson, General Pete Everest uh, around the piano, oh, and Carl Ballinger. Uh, 1950s, I left out of all her marriages. I'll do that just a second. Uh, 1950, General Stanley Holtner came out from New York, and his sole mission was to expand and improve Edwards Air Force Base. They were going to put in a 10-mile runway to accommodate atomic-powered aircraft. Thank goodness that that one didn't go. But uh, Pancho usually went out and greeted all the new commanders of the base, which she did for General Holtner. Uh, she was kept waiting for over an hour which you don't keep Pancho Barnes waiting. When she was finally ushered in, uh, he didn't look up from his papers that he was signing, and finally she said, do you know who I am? And he said, yes, you're the woman that picks up the base's garbage, which she did, because she had a garbage contract, and she fed the garbage to her hogs and traded the hogs back to the Air Force and credits herself as the first base exchange. But. Um, 
he was trying, Holtner was trying to condemn her place as a house of prostitution and that way they wouldn't have to pay her any compensation. So just to make sure she married uh, Mac McKendry, who'd been her ranch foreman for some years. Uh, she was married to a young man um, during the war. She married Don Shalita, who was a dancer in vaudeville. He was Persian, and then this was the fourth husband. She divorced um, Rankin about 1940. She hadn't done that, nor had he, because he wanted to become a bishop within the church, and to be divorced, he couldn't do that. But he met a lovely woman he fell in love with, and he decided it was time to move on with his life, so they had an amicable divorce at that point. So everybody on the base was there except for General Holtner. They had a one-minute civil ceremony and then uh, an Indian ceremony that went on for a couple of hours. Um, Robert Cummings, who was an Air Force instructor, uh, provided a lot of the entertainment for them. They had dancing ducks, a nude ballet, all kinds of things. And then, then the ranch burned down. The Air Force said she did, she said they did, and I, I'm 50-50. I don't know how the ranch burned down, except some things that she said were des destroyed showed up later on down the road. So I don't think she would have burned it down. But she moved north to Cantile, had a nasty divorce with Mac, had a double mastectomy, uh, was very ill. Um, she was going to start over again, but none of those things happened. And she lived out the rest of her life in Boron, California, in this converted mechanics garage. And um, she would have stayed just this crankety old woman that used to walk up and down just in men's underwear and boots. But in 1968, well, I'm jumping ahead, uh, she still raised her chihuahuas in Boron. She loved them. And she went, she was, had, Massive thyroid problems, as you can see from, I didn't even recognize her when I saw this picture. But she went to Paul Mans, who had taken her airplane in exchange for a loan of some money many years before, and he was going to give her back her travel air, but he was killed in the filming of The Flight of the Phoenix before he could do that. And then Frank Tallman, his partner, died, so the Tallman Mans airplane correction, collection went up for sale in Orange County. Um, Air, at the airport in the hangar, and uh, Poncho Bill and then Bill's wife, Shu Ling, is behind the bid card. When the airplane came up on the block, the announcer and everybody's bid paddles went up because they only built five of these, and this is the only one that a private person could own. Um, the auctioneer announced who was in the front row, and everybody's bid paddles went down, so Bill Barnes was able to poncho, or, uh, purchase back his mom's airplane. And Shuling, uh, my very good friend, she passed away just last year. And Bill was killed in 1980 in a P-51 crash. Well, Pancha was going to learn how to fly. Bill wasn't going to teach her because he thought for sure she'd kill herself. Probably would have. And she never did have a pilot's license. She only got her solo permit and a race permit and then a, a temporary air transport permit. So she would have to start all over. My husband was one of her instructors. And he said, she was so ornery, so ridiculous. She wouldn't study the rules. She just wanted to fly the airplane. So all the instructors kept passing her along. They could only tolerate so much. As a result, Pancho didn't get her pilot's license, but she was back in the limelight again. Everybody wanted to meet the society aviatrix, the speed queen, the woman who could swear, the woman could challenge. And if you challenged her, she'd, her swearing would reach new heights. But I did meet people that never heard her swear because it was for show. Uh, here she's with Bob Hoover, Chuck Yeager's sidekick, and then uh, Art Schull, uh, who was a stunt pilot, aerobatic pilot. And then, of course, Jimmy, and then Richard Arlen, who's an actor as well as a pilot. And this would have been at uh, one of the Barnes Dermer reunions that we had for our museum in Lancaster. And she loved Jimmy. She had the most obscene stories she could tell about that guy. <laughs> and then Chuck Yeager. And this, this is Pancho 
when she was older. Uh, Scott Crossfield, who just was killed in an airplane crash a couple of years ago, said that the t test pilots would sit around her bar and make wagers on who was the ugliest woman that they'd ever met. And Pancho won hands down. He said she, liked, sh she pulled nine Gs and never recovered. And today, they don't do this anymore, but on the grounds of her um, Rancho Oro Verde or Happy Bottom Riding Club, as people call it, they have a, a fundraiser, and this is the chimney that went to her house. Um, but because of um, security reasons, they haven't done this for quite a few years. Uh, this is a picture of the second pool that she built. First, she had a rectangular. Anybody know why there's a ramp into the circular pool? Right, absolutely. Horses took precedence over people. Uh, and this is my last shot of uh, Pancho, and then I'm going to start with Moy. But I, I left out something very important, and some of you probably want to know where the name Pancho came from. She was born Florence, which means flower, totally not her character. When she took a um, trip with a bunch of Hollywood film people, in a banana boat down to South America, and some people would say they were running guns, but I actually met the son of the captain of that ship, who was a test pilot. And uh, he said, no, they just were going down for a fling to have a good time. When they reached uh, the waters parallel to San Blas, Mexico, they were blown ashore by a Chubasco, which is a huge windstorm at sea. During this time was the Cristero Rebellion, and there were bandits on the coastline because the fighting was inland. And uh, they held the boat and the people on it captive. About 4th of July, Roger Shute, who was a radio man on the boat, decided he was going to escape by bribing the bandits with a bottle of whiskey. And she says, well, I'm going too. He says, I'm not taking you with me. If I was going to travel, it wouldn't be with the woman. So she taped her breasts and prayed it around like a guy. And he says, you know, you didn't have to do that because I thought you were a guy to begin with. <laughs> but in the morning when the sun came up, Roger was on a tall white mountain. Pancho was on a, a small brown burrow. And Pancho looked at Roger and said, you look like Don Quixote. And he said, well, in that case, you must be Pancho, my servant, meaning Sancho, but she liked the name Pancho. And if you translate that into English, it's Frank, which is somebody that's totally uninhibited. And that fit Pancho like a glove. And she always kept the name Barnes because it led a little bit of credibility that she hadn't really garnered herself all of her life. So uh, anybody have any questions about Pancho before we go around the world with Moy and Richard? I must have done a good job. Yes. She had, well, it was the Dobbins, the mother's side of the family, that had all the money, because Professor Lowe spent most of it on the railway and has other inventions. But Grandmother Dobbins had the very large house, which is the picture that the Historical Society has. And then there was another house that belonged to her mom. So when her mother passed away, she was given that, that home. And it's been, it was burned down by the fire department as a practice years and years ago, probably in the 50s. But she put an airstrip out um, in a, what is that area called? Uh, well, what is now McKnight Drive. OK. So there was an airstrip, and there were, it was a very short airstrip. And as a result, there were a few airplanes that didn't quite stop. <laughs> and they had to haul up from the beach. But she had horses there as well. And the thing that I like is, uh, of course, Grandma Dobbins had like a Newport, uh, Rhode Island mansion, yes. and uh, Pancho inherited her mother's uh, house, and uh, she threw fabulous parties. How fabulous were they? Grandma Dobbins says, move the house to the end of the property. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. So, Moy Stevens, um, was born in 1906, so he was uh, a little bit um, younger than Pancho. And he, oops, that was fast. He grew up in an estate in West Hollywood, 
Uh, his father and uh, most of his brothers were all lawyers. He went to Stanford University, and the goal was for him to become a lawyer. Um, but he really loved flying, and his father said, I, I won't pay for your lessons. You'll have to be able to pay for them if you want to learn how to fly. So Rogers, or Demille, and Chaplin Fields, Wilshire, and about Crescent weren't too far from the home, so he went over and made an arrangement with the uh, airport manager to trade work around the airport for flying lessons, which worked out quite well for him. And this is a typical Sunday when everybody came out uh, to take a hop around the field in an airplane for $5. And this Wilshire doesn't look like this anymore. <laughs> Uh, this is Rogers Field. The, this one s section, there was an airport on every corner, and then Emory Rogers came along and bought Chaplin Field, which was owned by Sidney Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin's brother. Um, and DeMille, the director, had DeMille 1 and DeMille 2, so he merged them all together into Rogers Airport. And these are a line of Jennies, and um, they too wanted to take everybody for a hop. I don't know why this advances so fast. Uh, this is a group of uh, typical pilots that would give up their last dime to go flying. Uh, this gentleman, Al Morgan, there were two good friends of Moyes, Al Morgan, Dick Rinaldi, which uh, you'll see later, um, and they did everything together. Leo Nomas uh, was their mentor. He let them fly his Jenny whenever they wanted to. Uh, he did a lot of directing for the movies, uh, for the aviation scenes. Here it shows him um, in charge of the aerials for most of the movies. So he was able to get his good friends. Uh, he got Moya some uh, jobs uh, flying in the movies, as well as Dick and Al. He also, they, a lot of the pilots drank when they flew. I mean, goodness knows we don't do that now, but Leo, his nose was very scarred from accidents. <laughs> and this is the Jenny that they flew. And these are all open cockpit airplanes at this point. Um, Eddie Belinde taught Moy how to fly, and Eddie would be responsible for a change in Moy's career uh, down the road, but he went on to have a long career in TWA. He's very well recognized as one of the leaders in that uh, company. And then Moy learned to fly in this airplane. It's called a standard. It's a very um, awkward, heavy type of airplane to control. Uh, he received his permit to fly by himself in September 1924. So when he returned to college, all he could think about was coming back to go fly. Um, during the summer, I think it was between his sophomore and junior year, um, Rogers Field moved um, near Clover in Santa Monica, but um, most of the pilots opted to move to Clover Field because that was a scene for all the movie uh, filming, um, all the aerobatic training. Um, Donald Douglas had a, a factory there. It was just, it was the place to be. This is the commercial side of the airport. On the other side, that's not being shown. Uh, it was a military section. And um, 1925, Moy was able to buy this little Thomas Morris Scout from Leo Nomis, which was a really nice airplane. But he never took it to school because it had too many engine problems. Uh, wouldn't have made it that far. But he was very proud of this, this airplane. Uh, these are just some fellows from Clover Field. This is uh, Dick Rinaldi, uh, Al Morgan. And Dick had a reputation as being a boy pilot, and you'll see why. There's a, a picture showing him in the cockpit. Uh, just some more shots with uh, Jenny. He was 14 when he was flying people around. He soloed after one hour. Moy tried to get him to go back to Hollywood High School, where they both had gone, and uh, Dick dropped out as a freshman. He said, I, I've got it all under control. I told the teachers, when you figure out they have something good to teach me, let me know. I'll come back. Um, during uh, one summer break, General or Captain Alan Hancock 
who supported the Kingsley um, flight to uh, Australia, came out to learn how to fly. He was a, cu uh, a client of the Stevens Law Firm, and uh, Moy was recommended. And I just love the Argyle socks that they always wore. But Moy was uh, bought this travel air. Uh, he borrowed the money from uh, Helen Hancock, so he taught him to fly in it, and he was also able to use it for the movies. Hancock bought this uh, Buell Air Sedan, which is a very sophisticated airplane. Um, Moy took his first long-distance cross-country flight back east to the factory with this airplane. And because he could fly this, he was able to get his next job. Uh, Moy flew in the Air Circus, was the movie. He um, stood in for the, I can't remember the lead actor's name. And uh, Wallace Berry was very tall. And Dick was really short, so I just throw that in because you can see the difference. And Wallace Berry was a pilot as well. I don't know if you knew that. And then that's Arthur Lake, who was in the, the movie Air Circus. And Dick was so small that he could actually sit in the front cockpit or the back cockpit with the actor and be down under the top of the fuselage, and they would cut holes on each side so he could see out as he was flying along. And um, Moy was coming in to watch Frank Hawks film one of his movies, and uh, he wasn't able to sh stop short in the canyon and cartwheeled his airplane. He was more embarrassed, hanging upside down with the seatbelt on when everybody rushed over to see if they were okay, and the director said, gosh, Moy, if I known you were going to do that, I could have included it in the film. But he destroyed the airplane. Uh, his next job, he had just started his uh, first year of law school. Eddie Belinde called him up and said, uh, we need somebody as a captain on Maddox uh, airline because a new airline is starting up, but you can't get a job on that unless you already have experience as a captain. So Moya went out. Uh, it took him a long time to think about law school flying, or was it a short time? He took up the flying and dropped out of law school. But uh, he had three takeoff and landings, and then the next day he was flying the gambler's run to Agua Caliente in the tri-motor with a full load of passengers. Uh, by the end of uh, 1929, or I think it was 28, Jack Maddox, who was a, actually a Ford dealer in Los Angeles, had uh, 13 Tri-motors. This is at Grand Central Airport in Glendale, California. You can see the mountains behind. Uh, this is just a, another shot of the terminal. And that's a Stinson Tri-motor. Um, in the late 20s to, I think, 33, when Prohibition was lifted, not only could people not drink in California or in the United States, uh, wagering or betting was outlawed as well in California. So everybody went south of the border to gamble and have horse racing to Agua Caliente, which was just a little bit north of Tijuana. Um, and the Campanile had the beacon for the airport on it. This is a postcard I found. It was just such a lucky thing. But um, this resort was actually designed by McAllister, who, who designed Bob's Big Boy, which I thought was interesting. Um, so the, ne the next airline, uh, Maddox merged with Transcontinental Air Transport, because rather than just flying to Mexico and up to Oakland or Alameda, wanted to fly cross-country. So Transcontinental Air Trans or Continental Air Transport was the next one. They went, all the pilots went back. This is Moy to St. Louis for training to learn how to wheel in the belly antenna for the radio before you touch down, because if you didn't, it ripped the antenna off. But they were a more sophisticated group, but they learned about weather as they went along. Um, in the back appendix of my book, I included the Book of Rules, which would be the ops manual today for any airline pilot to read and has things about please discourage passengers from cavorting up and down the aisles. And <laughs> but Moya has a story that he told that he was leaving Kingman and heading back to California. 
and they saw a line of thunder clouds. Well, they didn't know the potential danger of thunder clouds at that time, and they saw a little bit of light, and they figured, I'm going to head for that. As long as I can see the light and go under, I'll be fine. Well, he went into the thunder cloud at 7,000 and was spit out at about 15,000. So nose down, no power, he was still going up. And can you imagine in a Ford Trimotor, the 10 Lizzie, those poor passengers in the back, what they thought. But he was very lucky that he didn't get killed because not, not everybody survived being sucked up by a thunderstorm. Uh, but this was a big deal with this transcontinental air transport. The, um, this was at Kingman, Arizona, where they had the big billboard. They took the, tr uh, the airplanes during the day, and at night they put the people on, on the train. And this is the Hoi Moi and Lee, the Chinese crew, because <laughs> it was Ben Lee and... Uh, can you imagine? Anyway. So when they had the grand opening at Kingman, every business, not that it's a big town, but every business shut down because everybody wanted to come out and see um, the beginning of the airline. And this would become T plus WA, which it already had before uh, Moy had a phone call. And the phone call said, would you fly me around the world? And the gentleman calling hung up. And about three days later, the gentleman called back, and it was Richard Halliburton. So this shows uh, Moy and uh, Richard at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, where he stayed when he was in, in the Hollywood area, announcing the Round the World trip. And Moy's only condition was that he not be an employee. He just had all expenses paid. They did not share rooms. He had separate rooms. He was not... Uh, committed to any social engagements, and um, he would choose the airplane, which was a Stearman C-3B, which was a really substantial airplane, and they added extra fuel tanks so they had more range. So they bought the Stearman, they painted it up, and uh, Richard had flying carpet painted down the side. They had the American flag on the both sides of the um, rudder in the back because they wanted people to know they were Americans in case they were in warlike circumstances. And they took off from Grand Central December 1930. Their destination was Memphis to Richard's uh, family's home for Christmas. They arrived uh, the next day because they encountered a lot of weather and had a little trouble with the engine. So we have, this is the just a different pose of the same shot I showed with um, Poncho as Jimmy Angel, Richard Poncho, and, and then Moy. And they took off, and uh, a lot of their friends followed them a ways from the airport just to follow along. When they uh, arrived in uh, New Jersey, they put the airplane on the RMS Majestic, which was the largest ship of its kind at that time, and very typical. They um, shipped it to Southampton, and then the wings were put back on, and then from Southampton, crossed the English Channel, and then pursued their cross-country flights. Um, I showed some of you, I have one, well, I have all of the original maps from the trip that were made in London by the King's cartographer, and um, I'll have some when we get done, or one that you can look at. But they picked up their maps, not all of them, because they're very heavy in the cockpit. They had to make room for Richard's books and his portable phonograph and what, all these other things that he had. So essentially, they went from Southampton to Paris, and the dotted line is the return trip, and the straight line is the line that went all the way down to Timbuktu. And why did anybody want to go to Timbuktu? It was considered the El Dorado of Africa because during the 1400s, 1500s, it was the, uh, on the caravan route in northern Africa. And they thought the gold that they were getting came from Timbuktu, but it actually came up the Niger from further south uh, in the West Africa area. So it was a very 
fascinating, romantic, Timbuktu. I mean, I'd like to go and do a camel caravan to the salt mines, but not because it's romantic. But anyway, um, when they come back, and I'm just, just a second. We have a trigger happy thing here. Um, so when they, why is this doing this? I'm sorry, just a minute. Okay. Uh, when they come back, they follow the route, they fly over the Matterhorn. Um, all along the way, they're being met because Richard Halliburton's a well-known um, author, and their next stop is Istanbul or Constantinople. But I don't know if anybody in here flies, if you'd take an open cockpit airplane with only a compass, 1,600 miles of nothing. When they were in Paris, they met Jacques and Violet, or Violet de Cibor, who had flown around the world themselves um, a couple years earlier uh, in a very light, flimsy airplane, and she wrote a book um, called The Flying Gypsies. Uh, Moy wrote a letter home, and he said that, I met the most wonderful gal. She likes to fly. She's a big game hunter. She's pretty. She's got a good sense of humor, and if only I could find a woman like this, I would be so happy. So hold that, that's the beginning. There's a little love story in here. Um, when they left uh, Northern Africa, they stopped in Columba Shar. They were only gonna be there for a few days, but the Berbers were fighting the, the French, so they weren't allowed to leave and then the sandstorm came up, so they had to divert, actually, to go back north to Oran and then come down um, to head toward Timbuktu. And you note that they, they look very good. They took two or three suit jackets with them. They had tuxes because they were going to be entertained at night. So, um, Columba Shar, this is a typical Saharan oasis, and Columba Shar was actually the last of the large oasis that we see. Um, I've been through the Sahara twice, so I can really relate to the fact that there's nothing there for many, many days, for two weeks, as a matter of fact. Um, after they left Columba Shar, 1,600 miles to Timbuktu. So they had to follow the, the road because the, the mail truck went every two weeks from the north to the south. The military also used that road, but they were cautioned if a sandstorm came up and you had to go down or to land, stay exactly where you were. So Moy had to do some circling to pick up the road because sometimes it was very difficult to see. Uh, this is a typical shell gas pump in the middle of the desert. There was an, <laughs> and Moy actually was very ill or, he was looking for one of these um, oil pumps that Shell had along the way, and they paid for their fuel by putting a little chit in the box that said who we were or who they were and how much gas they took. But there's nothing to gauge the wind when you're in the Sahara. There's no trees. There's nothing to, to let you know where you are. So he was calculating where he should be at 5,000 feet, but he couldn't see the fuel spot. So he went down, you know, 2,000, 1,000. He was 50 feet off the deck, and he had his head out in the slipstream looking for this. Well, it's probably about 120 degrees in the slipstream, the heat from the engine, plus you've got all that silica from the sand. So he'd really seared his lungs and had a difficult time eating. But he did find it. He found some uh, oil drums along the side and, or gas cans and, and landed. And this is Timbuktu. It hasn't really changed too much. There were no cars in this place. There were no glass in the windows, no stores, just a very, very primitive place. Halliburton in his book states they were there to, for two weeks under velvet blue skies. Well, there were a lot of storks and there were a lot of bats and the smells were horrendous. And actually they were there only for two days when they headed back. Uh, this is probably the most elaborate building. It's the mosque, and they just put wood in there uh, to decorate it. This is very typical in most of the um, towns you see in Morocco, and particularly in the Sahara. Uh, on their way back, when they stopped in Kalambashar, 
the French Foreign Legion, there was thousands of them in Columbashar, and their headquarters were some 200 miles to the north in City Belabes. But uh, somehow, Richard, who is here, and Moy, they were able to get some French Foreign Legion outfits. And a few days later, the commandant said, oh, what would happen if something, somebody did something to that beautiful airplane of yours? Well, he wasn't very happy that they were parading around in the French Foreign Legion outfit, so they, they left and carried on to the north. That's just a, another picture under some of the date palms. And the little boy is a, a Toreg. So when they come back, and the logbooks that I had, um, they stopped in Cairo. So I had to kind of piece all of this together from Moy's letters home as well as the times and the, and the distances. And just to note that everywhere that Moy went, he was asked to perform aerobatics and stunts because he had this big 300 uh, horsepower engine and everybody else was flying around with 90 horsepower. So it was a pretty powerful engine. But here they are in, in Constantinople, looking nice, being entertained probably that evening by the governor. Um, this is the Blue Mosque or the ha Hagia Sophia behind them. And uh, they flew to Damascus, and between Damascus and uh, Baghdad, there is absolutely nothing in the Syrian desert. Midway is the Rootbart Wells, which is where all the Imperial Airways, the British Airways, uh, stop for fuel, which is where they stopped as well. And then on to Baghdad, where they took the, the Prince Ghazi. Uh, for lunch, and uh, he was only permitted to go if military airplanes escorted on each side so that makes sure that he returned. So they went south of Baghdad to Samara um, and had lunch on the Tower of Babel, which is good because that's what the military planes, that's the only reason we have the, the picture of this. And then off they went to Tehran. Um, and they were, flew along with the Lufthansa uh, airline because the, the distance and the terrain between Baghdad and Tehran was very treacherous. And Moy noted that not all of the maps were very accurate. Some of them, the lakes were two, three miles off course, and some of the mountains were a lot higher. But in, in Tehran, uh, they took two of the princesses for a flight, and at this point, not only did Moy have to deal with the planning of the flight and the fuel and the permits and everything else that went with this, but he had to deal with Richard's impulsivity, his impetuosity. Um, I think at this p time in the flight that he, he figured out that you couldn't just hop in the airplane and go. You needed to do a lot of preparation. But Moy flew south to Bushire on the coast where they had a maintenance factory for all the airlines tr crossing through Asia. There were some uh, issues with the uh, fabric covering on the airplane that needed to be addressed. And Richard took the, uh, the bus from um, Tehran down to Bushire because he wanted to go to um, Persepolis, Shiraz, Isfahan and see all the poets and things like that. So when they're in Bushire, uh, L.A. Beinhorn, who was Germany's sweetheart, was flying in her Klim, and the engine uh, quit on her just north of Bushire in uh, Bandar Dillum. She was able to hitch a ride into Bushire and uh, met Moy, and Moy flew back and fixed her engine for her. And after that, the two of airplanes flew along with each other all the way down to Singapore. Um, and this is the Klim that she was flying in. She had also previously been in Timbuktu, so they decided to name themselves the Timbuktu Club. So that's Richard, Ellie, and Moy. Uh, their next destination was to Delhi, and uh, well, they came up through Jodhpur, Delhi, and then they hired um, an airplane out of Delhi to film the flying carpet upside down or inverted over the Taj Mahal, which is what they're doing. And while they were there, they got a telegram from the uh, Calcutta Flying School or club that wanted to invite them to perform 
for the Maharaja of Nepal, which was a good thing because they hadn't been allowed to get permission to go into Nepal. They wanted to fly over Mount Everest. This shows you how little Richard Halliburton knew about airplanes because that's, what, 28,000? It's five miles high, 25. And the, the ceiling on the Stearman is 15,000 at best. So they, they flew to Dum Dum Airport, and that is the name of it, in Calcutta, and they put on a, a show, and the Maharaja gave them permission to fly into the country, and I think it was probably more because of uh, Ellie's endearing personality. And there's Ellie um, with the uh, Maharaja. And this is the second part of the love story that Moy falls very deeply in love with Ellie, but she does, and, and he proposes, but she is not ready to settle down. She's not going to leave Germany, and she has records to set in her airplane. But they did become very good friends all of their lives. So after um, Calcutta, they followed the coast. Um, they didn't really do any sightseeing. They stopped uh, for fuel overnight, flew down the Malay Peninsula to Singapore, where their floats or the pontoons were to be shipped to put on the steerman so that it could uh, fly over the ocean um, and go to Borneo, headhunter country in Sarawak. So when they got there, uh, steerman neglected to put in the struts to hook the pontoons on to the airplane, so they had to fabricate them out of boiler tubing. But they finally, after they were going to be there two weeks, and they were there for three months. So off they went to Sarawak, and they met um, the Raj, the last white Raj of Sarawak's wife, the Rani Sylvia, who considered herself queen of the headhunters, even though headhunting had been eradicated a few years before. So Sylvia is in uh, the center, and Princess Pearl, Princess Baba, and there was one other Princess Gold, I think, but she was off in London. And she had the same reputation with the British that Poncho had. <laughs> I don't think she swore, though. And this is there on the beach. They had a very uh, lovely palace. And there's actually a book called Sa Sylvia, the Queen of the Headhunters. It was a very interesting book. She went flying with them and uh, gave them directions and a gift to take to the chief of the Dayaks, who were headhunters, used to be, but not anymore. So they landed on the river. Um, this is at the Dayak's dock, and they never put or taxied the airplane up toward the land because they never knew how shallow or deep the water was, so they had to wait for a dugout or some type of canoe to come and get them. And this is the longhouse. It's kind of an early condominium-style home. All the people lived in it. Moya had one problem, though, because he's over six feet tall, that Coming back from a drunken celebration, he fell right to the pigsty below because he was so heavy for the, the matting or the flooring. But they were there for about three, four days, and then they took um, the Dayak chief for a flight, wanting to know if they could drop eggs on his enemies because he still didn't get this concept that it was not a bird. And his gift to... Uh, Moy and Richard was a bunch of head, head, or, um... Shrunken heads. Thank you, shrunken heads. It says that right there. Yes. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> but none of them went on the airplane because the airplane was already overgross with the pontoons on it, and uh, they stung, they really smelled, and they wouldn't have fit to begin with. But Halliburton says they took 100 heads or something, but they didn't take any. Um... They made some stops along the way, but uh, their last destination for the flight was Manila. And then they would put um, the um, airplane on a ship, the President McKinley, to sail back to San Francisco, and then the wings were reinstalled, um, and then they completed the trip at Grand to Grand Central. And we all know that Richard wrote a book the next year called The Flying Carpet. And Moy and Richard stayed in contact for off and on.
but then he went down at sea, I think I th it was 1939. Right. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So the next three years, Moy said, was the most unhappy existence of his non-flying career. He worked for, as a manager, administrator for one of his father's company, I think it was a bottle company, but he had an opportunity to, uh, three years later, to uh, join up with the Fairchild Distributorship he also joined Sheriff Eugene Buscalus, a Los Angeles sheriff, and he, uh, Moy's right behind him, their aero squadron. And this picture, does anybody know where this is? If you haven't gone to this, you should. It's the Flyers Wall at the Mission Inn in Riverside. It's really lovely there. But if, if you do go there, you'll see the whole wall is covered with wings. At this point, it wasn't. Um, Mid-1930s, um, Moy was asked by Lockheed to go to Australia, New Zealand to demonstrate the brand new Lockheed Electra state-of-the-art airplane. And we know that uh, that was the one that Earhart flew. And this is the third part of the love story and the last part. Uh, when they went there, it was also a honeymoon. Moy had met um, Ines who was a countess from Italy. She was the Countess of Trieste, who was a um, race car driver, an aerobatic pilot, beautiful woman, loved to have fun, um, and it was a match made in heaven, and so they traveled and, and to uh, Australia for their honeymoon. Uh, this is a picture of her former husband, Ross Hadley. They were all very good friends. He took the same type airplane as Moy and, and flew it to Australia. And then 1939, Northrop has lo left Lockheed because he's frustrated. He wants to d do his own designs. He created a flying wing back in 1929. It had a tail on it, but that was his dream. Moy and two other gentlemen wanted to form an aircraft corporation to design state-of-the-art airplanes, and they asked Northrop if he would come into it and lend his name to it because he had that reputation, and he said yes as long as... I do my designs, you do all the paperwork. So Moy was on the board of directors. He was also a uh, chief test pilot for several years. And his friend Dick Rinaldi, who dropped out of school, remember, as a freshman, he was also a test pilot. Um, and he flew the N1M, which M stands for mock-up of uh, Northrop's flying wing. This was called the Flying Jeep and state-of-the-art football helmet, I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> and this would have been a uh, uh, press day out at the desert, and no Nomex flight suits. They wore their suits and ties. And just uh, to notice that there's a, a connection, or a line of s screws here, or bolts, and what they could do is change the dihedral on that airplane to see which configuration the airplane flew the best in, and it actually was straight wings. So this was the airplane. That's the only color picture I actually found, and the press was out to watch it, and it, did, it was very, very successful. And that's one of uh, Northrop's designs. I think it's an Alpha in the back. So Moy was inducted into the Northrop Hall of Fame, and uh, he was given many awards. He's in the, the center, and then John Northrop here in the back. Interesting story, John Northrop uh, wanted Moy to fly this down to the plant in Hawthorne, and Moy said, I can't do that. I can't fly that at night over the mountains. It's not that stable. So Northrop fired him, and Moy said, you can't fire me. I'm on the board of directors. So anyway. <laughs> He didn't get fired. So he was a chief pilot on the prototype for the Volte Vengeance, uh, the P-56, uh, P-61 Black Widow. And he's right here behind Northrop. And he and Moy, or he and Ines, um, started their own business after the war. He was doing some commercial uh, freight work down in Brazil, but um, their one son, couldn't deal with the humidity, he had asthma very severe, so they had to come back to the States. So Moy became a representative for East Coast factories um, and distributed their parts on the, the West Coast. And then in 19, um, 
I think it was 1985-86, Moy was awarded title of Honorary Soci uh, Fellow for the Society of Experimental Test Pilots, which is the highest honor a test pilot can res um, obtain because it's chosen by uh, your peers. You have to be accepted by them. And I did ask uh, Moy's son, I s said, what was the most, um, or what achievement did Moy like the best or think was most memorable? And it was always the flying carpet trip because he was totally in control of that um, and they, they made it. They had no accidents. Um, they maintained their health with some you know, illnesses off and on, but uh, it was a very successful trip. And he, he, he thought about applying for a record as the longest flight around the world because it took him 18 months. <laughs> but they made it back safe and sound, and um, that's my last side. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I do have some books, cash, credit card, or check. That's it. I'm not so. Uh, what is it? <clears throat> Join me in thanking Barbara Schultz. So the, the 1932 book, uh, Flying Carpet, how successful was that? Oh, it was an incredibly successful. I, didn't, I think well, I've read any, uh, anywhere from 500 to 10,000 copies. I don't know how, how many they actually made. But um, I know there's two different versions. And it's very hard to find one with a cover. So I have one signed by Richard. You can tell that I really enjoy history. I think it's great. Uh, yes, front. 1975. And then her Rankin Barnes died one year and one day later. Yes, yeah, she had heart failure. There were rumors floating around that she'd been axed or done in, but you know, who's going to kill Pancho Barnes? Yes. Where is she buried? You know, or we. We spread our ashes over the Happy Bottom Riding Club as we did with Bill. And what about Moy? Moy, let me think. You got me, just a minute. I think he's buried in Laverne because the family had a large ranch there. I didn't think to ask about that, I don't know. So uh, how did this make sense? Richard Halliburton's born in 1900, and he's a graduate from, of Princeton. Mm -hmm. And uh, Moy Stevens is a graduate of Stanford, born in 1906. And they were able to uh, go off and do these uh, extraordinary things? Well, you know, at, at some point, adventure has no age requirement or limit, does it? We, uh, well, uh, uh, Ivy League education. But what's interesting about the research is all of these people follow each other, uh, at least within the aviation circles. You had a question? Well, Bar Barbara is an aviatrix. <clears throat> so Moy Stevens and Pancho Barnes are uh, pilots. And uh, Richard Halliburton. Yeah, I, I, I think. I didn't want more detail. I just every once in a while you say, "Oh, and well, that's just to show you the difference between what he wrote, as he told a reporter that he did everything. He just put lipstick on it. No, I think that Richard Halliburton was an incredible character, and I think that. Um, he experienced a lot of things. He traveled around the world, and I think he did people a service by writing about those and getting people to travel to those um, sites. But, um, you know, I didn't know him. I just, I don't know that he had the substance or the soul that Moy had, and Moy had to kind of rein him in. I mean, he actually even tried to teach him how to fly, but it was... He'd start looking at something and the airplane would go where he was looking. But no, I don't really have an opinion about whether I like or dislike Richard. He was part of my story. So no disservice to him. 
that answer that question? Okay. Yes. I'm curious about the nature of the relationship Bill Barr and Bill He seems to have been very like a generous but yet he posed to the himself. He Bill loved his mother, but they would be they would walk down the streets of Lancaster hollering and yelling at each other. But it was just the nature, because Bill was very quirky. In fact, I thought for sure that he was going to fail me on my check ride because he accused me of cheating and he's eating dye gels and I'm thinking, you know, this is not going well. But he, he just, um, he was an odd kind of guy, but very, my, my husband's very good friend. And I always stuck my foot in my mouth every time I saw Bill. I was going in to Barnes Aviation every day this one week because I was going to take my check ride. And he says, boy, you're here a lot, aren't you? And I says, yeah, I'm on a crash course to landing or flying. <laughs> oh, why do I say these things? But it was always like that. He just, he says, you don't know much once when he did my, one of my checks. And I said, no, I, I don't, <laughs> because he put me through the ringer. And he says, well, you learn, you're willing to learn? And I said, oh, absolutely. But he just, uh, he was a, an odd kind of guy. And um, he was married actually three times, never had any children himself, but Shuling, his last wife, had uh, three kids. But um, no, Bill and Pancho took Bill everywhere, and he became an authority on aviation history, a um, um, meticulous restorer of aircraft. So they had a, a really good bond, even though the relationship was not warm and cuddly. Yes? It's still there, yeah. Yeah, so it's really nice to drive by and take a peek. Uh, so, Barbara, for those who would like to get a copy of one of your books or both, what, what is the price? The Poncho book is 18 and the Flying Carpet book is 25. Okay, 18 and 25. And uh, I had put in the newsletter to learn how uh, Poncho Barnes had gotten her name. And um, the reason for that, and the reason I wrote you the email talking about what detail is in the book that just blew me away. For many years, somebody would say, how did Poncho Barnes get their name? And I would answer, well, she uh, uh, signed up for a freighter going down to Mexico. She disguised herself as a man, and, uh, her, uh, and they, they called her Poncho. And everybody said, thanks, Gene. You're very knowledgeable and informative, and we appreciate the information. So. Uh, the, the story that uh, Barbara writes, as, as you went through there, uh, there she's, she's just on this uh, freighter or this boat having a good time with friends. And of course, Mexico has had many upheavals, and one of them is to be anti-Catholic uh, mm -hmm. and uh, to take the missions away, for example, and so forth. And so when they uh, get blown into this port in uh, I guess it's the Gulf of California, or, or, or down there anyway, Baja California, there's a rebellion going on. Who's rebellion? Rebelling. The Catholics. So they have, what is that, Christy? Cristero. So they put a, they put, not only do they take the, uh, the boat, they have a whole siege on the town. And... You know, one of the things is, if you're ever sitting there negotiating for a ransom, don't ask for all the money. <laughs> so so when, they, when, they, when, the, when the rebels make the demand that they, you know, of course, you're going to have a revolution, you need money, right? So they make a demand, and the townspeople figure out that's everything. And uh, so sure enough, they capture the boat, they keep everybody hostage and so forth. So this trip where this uh, gentleman decides he's going to escape. Pancho finds out he's going, she's going too. Where are they going? So tell that part. Oh, they decided to escape and go straight across to Yucatan, <laughs> which was the safest because there was no fighting going on 
Well, actually, they were in the big cities, so they avoided uh, all the large cities, and they thought everybody thought she was a guy, so there was really no danger as far as being a female. But uh, they had some close calls, but um, they finally got a ship out of Campeche up to New Orleans. So they had, uh, it was, you know, I've got a good idea. Let's escape. Let's go 300 miles. We'll get a couple of mules. I'm tall and skinny, so I'll be Don Quixote. <laughs> and what did you say? Pancho means uh, servant? Right. No, Sancho was his servant, but Ro Roger had said Pancho instead of Sancho. Uh, Don Quixote's uh, sidekick is Sancho Panza. Panza, yeah. And, uh, and uh, 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 Florence replied, I like Pancho better. So... Uh, only $18. It's full of all kinds of great things. Why don't you uh, go over there and uh, sign books, and I will uh, close our meeting. Join me once again in thanking Barbara Schwartz. <laughs>